Well, how many of you have seen the TV series, This Is Us? How many of you have seen that show? It's, it's kind of a popular, popular series. It's going to get a second year, I guess, so that means it mattered to some, pe- some people. Well, we wanted to play off that title and ask the question, Is This Us? We're going to talk about the character and uh, the uh, purpose that God has for our lives, specifically in relationship to our families, our marriages, as parents, as children in responsibility to our parents. And we're going to do this over the next few weeks. Now, I, I don't know. I've loved being a grandpa. I just, it's, it's the best gig ever. I got three little grand boys. And they're just, they just blow me away. I mean, and, and it's kind of fun to watch their parents, you know? Like, here's this couple in love, and they got all the freedom in the world to do whatever they want to do, anytime they want to do it. And like in one moment, that goes away. Their whole life just goes into this kid, you know? Their whole world changes in an instant. Now, writer and mom Rebecca Wolf wrote this. 15 notable post-baby observations. I'm not going to give you all of them, but here's a few. You can finally stop and smell the roses because your baby is in your arms. Isn't that sweet? Along with that, bodily functions are no longer repulsive. In fact, they please you. (laughs) Hooray for poop. (laughs) Hey, it's a big celebration. They hit that thunder throne, and you're really happy about it, let me tell you. The sacrifices you thought you made to have your child no longer seem like sacrifices. Where you once believed you were fearless, you find out that you have a lot of fear. You respect and love your parents in a new way. You find that your child's pain hurts you far more than yours does. With children... Every day is a surprise. And because of children, love can become superhuman. Ephesians chapter 5 says this, verse 1. Follow God's example. Listen to the phraseology. Therefore, as dearly loved children, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice, to God. Now, here's an epic fact. Love is God's dream for you. Love is what God is all about for you. Today, we're simply going to ask a question, is this us, though? Am I basing my life on the model of God's love for me? Because I think when we start talking about marriage, when we start talking about being a parent, when we start talking about uh, being a child who needs to love their parents, the Well, I think that it all has to start here, the basis of God's love. And in that verse that we just read, Paul's writing to adults, but he's addressing us as children. Now, most of us don't like that. Most of us, you know, by the time we hit the age of maybe 11, 12 years old, I mean, who wants to hear their parents or have their parents treat them like kids or like children? You know, junior. You need to eat right. You need to eat all your peas and carrots, and you need to go to bed at a, at, at a, at a decent time, and, and you need to make sure that you're finishing all your work. Mom, I know I'm 31 years old. I've been working on that all this time. You'd have to keep telling me, right? But yet moms do that, right? I mean, how many of you? Don't raise your hand. She might be here. Don't. But you got that mom. You got that dad, right? And we kind of rebel against that. When we begin to dialogue about the family and relationships, we simply need to stop and rejoice that God alludes to us as being his dearly loved children. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. In Romans chapter 8, 15, Paul writes in another place, the spirit you received does not make you slaves. God doesn't see you as some minion to him, some, some robot, some slave to do his thing. He says, you don't need to live in that kind of fear. He said, rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. By him, we cry, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Now, Abba is the Aramaic equivalent to Dada. That's what that means. That's what it means. 
I mean, how does it make you feel when your, your child says to you for the very first time, mama or dada? It's an it's a epic moment. There's always some contest between mom and dad about who gets that first, right? Because it's a huge moment. I know when we start talking about God as our father, there are some of us who are here today who that immediately isn't a positive thing. It might be a negative thing because we tend to associate that term with a man on earth who maybe wasn't so great for us. Or, or a mom, a mom who wasn't all that great. And so we have a hard time seeing God in a good light as a parent because the example that was set by the guy or the, or the lady who, who gave us birth, maybe it, it wasn't so great. But I want to say this, no matter how good or bad your earthly parent has been, your parent is nothing like God because God is perfect and they are not. Before I had kids, I'd say things like, man, I love a good movie. I love Valentino's Pizza. I love the smell of a new car, which you give up most of that when you have kids, by the way. But after having a child, at least to some extent, having a child, you know, you're, the, the word love takes on a whole new dimension. You know, it, it just, you can't even describe it. It's a protective, it's a fierce you know, a a love without end kind of love. And most parents are like that, most of them. That's what God's love for his kids is like. That's why he gives us his example. But the difference is he's perfect. Now, we hear that, we say, well, love, what is God's love? I mean, is that like, you know, I love pizza. I love, you know, I love the the royals. You know, what is that? Well, it's much deeper than that. What does God's love look like? Let me give you seven quick things. They'll go fast, I promise. First of all, God's love takes the first step. 1 John 4.19, John writes, We love because he first loved us. You don't have the capacity to love except that God loved you first. That's the way it works. Now, how many of you have fallen in love before? Let me see your hands. If you're married, you better have that hand in the air right now. You're going to have the worst Mother's Day of your life if that hand doesn't go up. Let me tell you right now. So one time I'll let you lie. No, I'm just kidding. We won't. I know you mean it. I mean, at first it's like you like, you know, you like each other. Unless you had, unless it was love at first sight, you like each other, right? And then, you know, as things progress, you get to that, guys, you know what this is like, right? That first time you're going to say it. And, it get, you know, there's three words, they just kind of, uh, I love you. And then here's what you don't want to hear. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> oh, I like you too. Oh, that's a bad day. God doesn't play those kinds of games with us. He says, no, I love you. I dearly love you. He took the first step. He took the first step when he made you. And then he took the next step when he put Jesus on this earth to redeem you. He loves you with a fierce kind of love so he could adopt you into his own family. And our family has experienced adoption in the last two years. Believe me, it's a wonderful, beautiful way of having love. And God says he's done that for us. His love is unconditional. The ancient world describes God's love for us and, 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 and for his kids as, as an unconditional, one that we can't understand because we really don't see unconditional love very much in our world. We say we have it for each other, but be honest. Unconditional love is almost impossible because of sin. The closest thing we have to understand unconditional love is a newborn baby. That's when it all makes sense to us. I mean, because that baby can do anything, and we love them. Like, I get on Facebook like once a week, okay? Like, like once a week for like 10 minutes. And there's going to be all kinds of posts with little babies on that post. Now, hey, they're all cute. I love them all, okay? Cutest ever. But sometimes they're not so cute. Like, you as the parent, grandparent, you think it's cute, but somebody else might open up and say, Conehead. Hairless, splotchy face. You know, I mean, it's, they'll grow out of it. 
but for you, what's cute? Maybe for someone else, eh, they'll get out of it. Now, God makes us that way. They cry, they mess themselves, they demand everything all the time, but they're, we're unconditional. We love them all the time. This is us because this is God. Spiritually, we can be ugly. We can mess ourselves. We cry a lot. But even though we're homely, we're God's homely kid. We're God's messy kid. He still loves us. He's unconditional about that. Don't doubt it. Now, here's another thing. His love is inclusive. John 3, 16, you know this verse probably. God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. Now, I want to stop there before I go further. God so loved what? The world. That means all of us. He's inclusive. He gave Jesus because he says whoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. Now, Jesus said this about it. He said, a new command I give you, to love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. That's another thing about love. It motivates us. Love motivates. It means that I can love just like he loves. I can love him. I can love him first. I can love him unconditionally. I can love him inclusively. And we can do that too, but it's a big task. How do we do it? That's where Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 comes in. We imitate him. God gives us Jesus so we know how to love each other. And so that's why we have the Gospels. And that's another thing. Love takes action. It's not just a thought to ponder. It's not just something we sit around in a church and talk about for, you know, 20, 25 minutes and we go out and do our thing. Love is an action word. It has to act or it doesn't even matter. You know, the message version of John 13, 34, and 35 says this. And I like this. Watch what God does, then do it. Watch, then do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. See that? Isn't that great? Now, it's parenting 101. And that is why it's so crucial that as parents we spend time with our kids. Because, you know, you, you have to have some time with them. You have to, you have to, they have to see how you live your life. I did the dumbest thing in the world, like, when Taylor was, like, nine. I agreed to coach youth soccer. Are you kidding me? Like, this guy coaching youth soccer. I, I didn't know anything about it in the first place. I had to get on the Internet just to figure out how the rules worked. I still don't understand it. So I go out there. You should have filmed that. You know, if you would have had it on film, you could use that against me for years. But I'd, I'd coach them how to play soccer. We won a lot of games, but we didn't know anything. But here's the thing. I got to be with my kid. You know, we got to spend some time together. You have to ask him what he thought of that. I liked it. But there was no proper behavior to be found. No soccer behavior, at least. But how do I walk in the way of love? I spend time with Jesus. And so we have a Bible. It has four accounts called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that show us Jesus. And so put that in your heads. Read it. If you're not a reader or if you don't like reading, listen to it. Hear the Gospel. Understand who Jesus is. Get to know him. You have a Bible, 66 books in the Bible that tell us about God, that tell us about his principles, that tell us about his heart, his character, his motives. Get to know him. I'm not a great reader, but I listen. Maybe you're a great reader. Maybe you're one of those people that get up at 5 in the morning and have your Bible out and, you know, your juice or coffee and you're just that person. God bless you. I think you're wonderful. But that's not me, so I listen. You know, I read a lot too, but I listen to the Scripture. Behavior is caught more than it's taught. And the more time you spend with Jesus, the more you're going to be like Jesus. And, you're, you know, you're, you know this, right? The, the people that are in your life, the ones that you associate with, the ones that you spend time with, these are the people that you likely will become like, right? Do you understand that? I think you do. That's why parents are so dogmatic about this with their kids. I don't think you should hang out with that bunch. I don't know if they're very good for you. 
I don't know if you should go out with that boy. He's not the best boy in the world for you, right? Anybody? Or is it just me? <laughs> right? And they say, oh, you're so old-fashioned. Yeah, they, they know how to they know how to work you, right? Especially teenagers. Oh, I thought you were a Christian. I thought you loved everybody. What's wrong with them? Hey, I love them. I just don't want them in my house, okay? <laughs> huh. But you know how that works. I mean, you you get it. And I'm not advocating some sort of elitist society where the only kids that your kids can befriend are the ones who go to church and carry Bibles everywhere and that creep other kids out because they're kind of weird. But on the other hand, the longer you hang out with people, the more you tend to be like them. And so here's another way to put that. It isn't just from telling our kids how to be. It's us being how we should be. Does that make sense? So a dad can say to his son, son, I... I want you to treat your mother with respect. Son, I really would prefer that you don't drink at all, and I know you're too young now, so don't do it. Son, I want you to have your priorities straight and work hard and work hard at school. Now, that's all good and well. But if you belittle your wife and you model to them that alcohol has to be at the center of their fun and their hobbies are more important than their family, well, your words don't mean anything. Children are a great mirror for us. They learn by watching. They learn by observing. But you have to have some patience with yourself too because you're not perfect. God is perfect. You're not. And so, I I, I don't know. I'm going to be honest about this. I'll wake up certain days and I'll say, you know, I've got this thing figured out pretty good, this parenthood stuff. I'm a pretty good dad. But then I'll get up other days and I'll say, I don't think I'm even a Christian. You know? And so, we have to be honest about this. That's why we got to get into the Word, so we can see how Jesus lived his life and what he teaches us. Now, here's, a, here's another thing. Love takes commitment. To imitate God takes commitment because to follow him goes against the grain of almost everything you've been taught. I mean, we've been taught to live for ourselves. We've been taught to live for the moment. God shows us to love others and to live for eternity. And, you know, I I talked about adoption earlier. I tell you, I think one of the most giving things that a human being ever did for for our family is to say to my kids, would you raise our child? That's love. I mean, that's amazing stuff. And you know what? For many people, that doesn't make sense. It makes a lot of sense to us. His ways are not our ways. God wants to adopt us. That's his heart for us. Isaiah 55, 8 through 11 says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declare, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts higher than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater so is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve for the purpose which I sent it. You know what that's saying? That's just saying that God has a way, and if we'll imitate it, we will do well in every aspect of our life. If we will imitate our Father, we will do well. A couple of weeks ago, I was getting ready for a wedding, and I was shaving, and Ezra, our two-year-old grandson, came in, and he saw it. He had to get in on that, let me tell you. It had all the components of, of, of greatness for a, for a two-year-old. It had Papa, white foam all over the face, a mirror, and a sharp object. I mean, <laughs> what more would a two-year-old want, Right? I have a picture, by the way. You might want to see that. There he is. Yeah, that's a triple blade razor right there. We don't mess around at my house, let me tell you. No, that was just some kind of thing that Jackie pulled out of the kitchen drawer. I have no idea what it was. But here's the thing about this now. Ezra, he has no concept of what the 5 o'clock shadow is. None. He has no concept for why Papa needed to do that activity. 
but because I was doing it and because he is curious and because I had the potential for a huge mess, he's all in. And all he grasped that is he wanted to be like me. That was it. Now, someday he'll get it. Someday it'll be so routine he won't want to do it anymore. But it has to go beyond imitation at some point and be a life, a lifestyle. It has to have purpose. As God's children, we often don't understand the big picture. We often don't understand why we do the things that he's showing us that we should do. All we can do is imitate him and trust him. And that's one more thing. Imitating God's love shows our love for him. You say, I want to show God I love him. The best way is to obey him. As a matter of fact, have you ever read that book, Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman? Anybody read that? It's a good book. It's got some great principles. It's got these five languages that all people at some level uh, live into about love. And so there are things like gift giving and words of affirmation. And I can never remember the other three because those two are mine, but I have to look at my notes. So they're... Okay, uh, oh yeah, uh, physical touch, quality time, and acts of service, right? I think there should be a sixth love language. Gary missed one. It should be obedience. Obedience. To love God is to obey his commands. In fact, this is love for God, John writes, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. To obey God is to love him and to love his people. To love God is to imitate his love as we love others. Let's be children who imitate our loving, powerfully loving, adopting father. Let's make sure this is us. Lord, we come to you now at this table of remembrance, and it shows us in a very symbolic way the kind of love you have for us. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. And so, Lord, today as we take these emblems of remembrance, may we take them from this table into our world, into our families, into our marriages, into our raising our children, into our neighborhoods and schools. May this be us, Lord, people who live out your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.